and learning. So this is joint work with my student, Amir Atta Gorbani, who's a student, PhD student at Stanford. And a lot of the work is based on a paper that we discussed a few weeks ago at ICML, as well as some more recent follow-ups. OK. So there's been a lot of talk about you know, how data is really the fuel or electricity or whatever analogy you want to make that drives all the data science and machine learning. Right? Um, and for many people who actually work on applications of machine learning, they know that uh, you know, getting the right data sets together is really probably the most challenging aspect of getting the machine learning system to work. Right? So getting the right data sets is really affects everything that we do here. Right, so if you are you know, a machine learning researcher or analyst or engineer, right, so you typically you have data from different sources, maybe from different hospitals, from different patients, and data have different qualities. Right, so you want to know what kind, of, what kind of data has higher quality than others, what data, what data is more useful to collect. Right, so if you are actually a data vendor, which is many of the companies around here, right, uh, they have the business model of, sort of collecting data or buying and selling data sets. Right, so they have the problem of how to really kind of come up with the right values, the price for the data that they're buying and selling. And probably more importantly, so if you're actually an individual consumer or a data producer, which I think all of us here are, um, then there's very important questions, regulatory questions about how do you, what's the right way and what's the fair way to compensate individuals for the data that they generate, the data that they produce. And so this is ex actually extremely salient now, so just um, a couple of weeks ago, at the end of June, right, so there's a bill in the U.S. Senate which proposes to, um, to mandate the SECs to, to uh, compute the value of data for all the companies with 100 million consumers or more. Right, so if you're one of these large companies, to, in order to, uh, to, to be evaluated by the SEC, you have to actually quantify the value of the data consumer data that you're, you're collecting. Uh, and locally here in California, right, so the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has also proposed policies of data dividend, whereby individual consumers in California will actually be compensated by the tech companies, by the Google and Facebooks, for the data that they generate. Right, so for all of these, right, so it, uh, the policies are interesting, but there's also the questions of, what, is, what does it actually mean to fairly compensate individuals for the data? Right? What is the value of those data? So that's really the goal of, um, of the talk today, to think about what is the right framework to think about data valuation, especially in the context of machine learning. Right? And so that's, I think, the sort of core fundamental problem that we want to address if we want to uh, tackle each of these different application areas. Um, and it's, uh, so my, I think of this as really an important problem for both machine learning data science communities, but especially for the fairness community. Right? So I think there's a lot of interesting questions here about what is the, the fair way, the equitable ways to actually compensate or to, uh, to credit individuals for the value of their data. Uh, and despite, I think, being a quite a foundational important problem, there's actually relatively little work done on this uh, in the broader community. So I'll talk about some recent works, uh, but actually uh, I think there's a lot of room for new works um, which I'm hoping to discuss here. Okay, so to make this a little bit more concrete, right? So specifically, we're interested in the value of data in the context of machine learning, right? So more, uh, more, uh, and supervised machine learning mostly. I'll talk about for this talk. So here, the idea is that so you have some training data that's used to train some particular predictor, right? Maybe you want to predict for breast cancer, or you want to predict for diabetes, right? You collect data to train a predictor for that task. The data here can come from different sources, right? This could be different hospitals, different individuals, or different data vendors. It could have different qualities. Your predictor is going to achieve some performance, right? Some accuracy or F1 score or your favorite metric, right? For that task that you're interested in. So the goal here is how do we actually say that which data point is responsible or, or deserves credit for the mistakes or the, for the good performance that this predictor achieves? Okay, so a little bit more concretely, so the, the setting that we're working with here will have three main ingredients, right? So it's common ingredients for supervised machine learning. So we start with some data sets. So you can think of each individual point here as being data from a particular individual or from a particular source, right? So each data point actually could be itself a subset of data. So you have a particular learning algorithm. This could be your favorite deep learning algorithm or SVM, right? That takes the data and learns a predictor. 
And you tell me what is your favorite performance evaluation metric, which could be accuracy, uh, F1 score, right? Your favorite metric. And when you have these three ingredients, right? So we let's say if your algorithm trained on this data set achieves accuracy of 0.8. So the problem of data evaluation that we talk about here is that you want to actually allocate that point eight to each of your three data points or three data sources. All right, so just a couple of remarks here. So here, the value of a particular data point here depends on all three ingredients of my machine learning pipeline. Right? It depends on who else is in my training data sets, depends on the learning algorithm itself, and also depends on your specific task and performance metric. So if you use a different metric or use a different prediction task, your value could differ. Um, right. So there are many possible ways to think about how to split up the performance value among the training data points. Right. So um, a very common one is basically this approach. It's called leave one out method. So I'll just briefly describe it here. And this is probably the most widely used or maybe the the most intuitive version of how to quantify the value of data. Right, so suppose I have uh, these three data points. I train a model on this. And I'm interested in thinking about what is the value of this star here. Right. So the simplest approach intuitively is I just simply leave the star out, right? remove it from my training data. Now I have the other two data points I train, fit in through my learning algorithm. Right? Maybe I will learn a different classification boundary, decision boundary. And the chiefs, and I see what is the performance of my learning algorithm when this data point is no longer present. Right. So the change in the performance of the, of the learning algorithm when the data point is present or absent, so that's my leave one out score for that data point. And I can do this in principle for every data point in my training set. Right. So this is actually a very widely used statistic in statistics and machine learning. Uh, under many variations, an approach is to approximate this leave one out score. Right, so the recently, there's been a lot of work, very nice work in machine learning on computing leverage scores or influence functions, influence scores, which are all essentially approximations to this leave one out score. So that's just one, uh, um, you know, one approach to capture the value of data. And the question here is this, you know, does this leave one out score, or LOO for abbreviation, does that actually capture the importance of individual data sources, individual data points? Right, so what are the properties, and does it satisfy some desirable properties? Um, so I'll discuss today is that this standard kind of leave one out score actually has both quite uh, a lot of theoretical and empirical limitations when we actually want to apply it to quantify the value of data in machine learning. Right. Um, and in, so as, a, as an alternative, so there's been some several recent works um, basically proposing this concept of data Shapley value as an alternative to compute the value of data. So this is actually a series of, sort of parallel papers, including our paper uh, a couple of weeks ago from ICML and a couple of other nice papers presented recently that exp explored the idea of the data Shapley value. So to motivate the Shapley value, I want to first tell you about what are some general principles, uh, let's say desirable properties that we would like any data valuation scheme to satisfy. Right. So if we agree on these principles, then we can naturally lead to what this data Shapley value is. So the first property that you know, maybe we all care about is that, OK, so if I have a data particular data point, right, if I add that data point to any other subset of my training data, if by adding that, it never changes the performance of my training data. Right? Then the data point does nothing for my training algorithm, and I should assign it zero value. Right? And you should uh, ask me questions if you have complaints about any of these. Yes? So if the subset of the rest of the data you take is the null set, then any data point will always have value, right? Not necessarily, right? I mean, I could have a, it, so, in, you know, so I could have data points that just really just adds nothing to my learning algorithm, has no information content. So, so here I'm saying that in principle, if, this is, if it never changes the performance, then I should assign it zero value. Okay, so the second property is that um, we have two data points, right? If adding that data point to any sub sub subset of my data also uh, achieves the same performance, then basically by symmetry, I should assign the same value. 
And the third one, uh, I think it's, it's easier to explain the context of machine learning, right? So it's this decompostable property, which says, so in machine learning and supervised learning, right? So your typically your performance is defined as on some test data set, which is usually a sum over the performance on individual test points, right? If you're looking at accuracy, then you look at the average accuracy across a bunch of independent test points. Then the idea here is that if I add or remove a particular test point from my evaluation metric, right, I should simply be adding or removing the value of each training data point for that test point. Okay. Yes. Should I think of the value function just taking the input of the individual data point, or should I also think, think about it as a function that might both the individual data point and also the existing data you already have. Like, should you have two inputs or one input? Yeah, so the, the, the actual value function is actually going to depend on all three ingredients. Right? It depends on who's my, like, my entire data set, all the points in it, uh, the particular learning algorithm, and my performance metric. And so it depends on all three ingredients. OK. So if we agree that these three properties are reasonable, um, then, um, then there's sort of a, uh, essentially only one way to value data that satisfy these properties. Uh, it's given by this formula, so let me just parse it for you. So the value of particular data of point K, right? so here's what, what, we, what we do to compute it. So you look at all the possible subsets of your data, that does not contain this point K, right? So you see, okay, so how much does the performance change if I add K to that subset? Right, so this, this is basically the marginal change in performance by adding the point K. And I do some normalization by dividing by the number of sets that have size K. Right, just some, some weighting scheme normalization. Right. And it turns out that this is uh, basically the, the only way you can value data if you want to satisfy these desirable properties. Right, so the intuition of this is that this is really computing the expected contribution of adding this data point, uh, where the expectation is over all the possible sets. Right, so the difference from leave one out scores is that the leave one out is only looking at the mar marginal contribution of adding data points to the rest of the data, right, so the n minus one other data points. But the Shapley value is actually computing the marginal contribution averaged over all possible sets, right, from the both small data sets Right, one or five data points to, to a larger subsets of your data. So it's looking at across this whole resolution, which potentially gives it higher, uh, more information content. Okay, so here's the illustration of how we can actually compute Shapley value for the same example. Right. So first what we do is that we look at, uh, uh, the first step is the same as the leave one out score. Right. But now we have to look at other subsets. Right, so if I'm looking at the star point, right, so I look at its marginal contribution when I add it to the red point or when I add it to the other blue point. Right. And I also add, uh, compute how much it adds if it's the point by itself. Right, so these are all the possible marginal contributions of this star, and I add all of that together with some appropriate weighting, and I get the score of 0.05. Okay. Yes. So this is something you're computing at every step in the learning algorithm? That's right. So I'll tell you, um, so a lot of our work is on like, developing efficient algorithms to estimate this Shapley value. So I'll tell you in a bit about how do we actually estimate this. Right? But for, this is, yeah, so if you want to compute it exactly, then you have to compute it every step of your learning algorithm. So you said that you could actually group some data together and called the set one data point, right? Yes. So what's the relation between the Shapley value of the, if you break up the set of the individual points in the set versus the Shapley value of the set itself as one, treated as one point? Is there a relationship between them? It's a good question. So um, in general, there's not a clear relationship between the, the Shapley value of the individual data points and the sets, right? Um, so here we often use sets if we want to first just make it computationally more tractable uh, first, we just group individuals that are from, maybe from the same hospital together to say what is the value of the, all the data from that hospital. Right, so I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, so the credit of the Shapley value really goes back to, uh, to economists. 
right? Uh, so it's actually been well studied in economics, this idea of Shapley value. So the setting there is that you know, if everyone in this room, if we all work together to solve some task and we get a bonus, right? so how do we actually split up that bonus around everyone in this room so that everyone you know, is fairly compensated? Right? So that's the, kind of a core idea from cooperative game theory. So the variation here is that instead of having individuals, right, so individual brings their own data, so everyone's data then work together to achieve some task, which in this case would be training this machine learning algorithm. And the algorithm achieves some performance, which we then want to allocate back to the individual data points. Right, so that's the analogy to the Shapley value. Okay, so here's the, the agenda for the rest of the talk. So I want to first tell you, now we introduce these two ideas of data valuation, right, the Shapley value and the leave one out scores. So how do they actually compare across various empirical performance, the empirical data sets? The second part is actually now that we have this Shapley value, can we actually apply it to improve somehow these fairness tasks that we care about? Right. And lastly, there are, there are questions about how to efficiently estimate Shapley value and other statistical properties that, that we might care about. Yes? So you haven't really explained how the Shapley value translates into the value, monetary value for the data set or point. And I am worried about things like budget balance. Yeah, so I was going to talk talk a bit, a bit more here. So, so right now, the Shapley value, you know, so it's a well-defined concept, right? So it gives you a value for every training data point, right? Uh, and the sum of the value for the training data points will equal to the, the final performance that I care about. Um, you decide on the purse and you partition it according to the Shapley value. Yeah, so my purse here is just the final performance metric, right? My, maybe my accuracy. Right, and I'm going to allocate that accuracy entirely among each of my training data points so that they sum up to the, to the final performance. Yes? So like the leave one out uh, value, the Shapley value can be negative? Correct. So am I right in thinking that typically a point that the classifier gets wrong will confuse the training algorithm if it tries to get it right and thus will slightly decrease the, you know, decrease the accuracy, and that's, well, it seems like there's a lot of settings where the data that the classifier gets wrong are actually really, really useful. And yeah, so in, in particular, it might stimulate you to go to a better uh, class of classifiers and recognize that there was something systematic that you were getting wrong. So the, the idea that the right. things the classifier gets wrong have negative value is, I don't know if that so let me actually show you some examples of that, right? Um, of where the negative values come from. But that, that's a great point. Okay, so, so I think we're all excited to apply this concept, right? So we applied it to actually a bunch of data, so real data sets. So this is actually, uh, the UK Biobank is actually one of the most valuable uh, large data sets in the biomedical communities, right? So it's about half a million people. We have the genetics, medical records from each of these individuals from the UK. Right, so the data, you know, it's a huge international effort. There are many, many uh, academic groups and companies using this data set. So here we just compute the Shapley value for the data set. Right, so the data is actually collected from these 22 locations in the UK. Right, so the bar here indicates how many individuals actually are, are participants from each of those locations. And here we're looking at a particular prediction task, which is a sort of a common task of predicting lung cancer diagnosis uh, going forward, right, for risk for lung cancer. Um, and here we're going to compute the Shapley value for each of those locations, right, for each of the centers. Um, and we do find exactly the, the setting that you mentioned, right, so it's, it is possible that you have locations where the actual, the Shapley value for that location is negative. Right, so in particular for Nottingham, so you has actually have quite negative Shapley values. Right, which means that intuitively that it's actually the data from Nottingham is actually uh, skewing the predictive model in a way that's detrimental to its overall performance. Okay, so now the question is, so it does sort of invite the follow-up, is what is happening in Nottingham, right? So what's going on there, and can, can that give us additional insights? And so we dig deeper into this, so it turns out that actually the data quality at Nottingham is just as good as the data from other places, right? So maybe the first, first, uh, Recently, you might think for data here have been negative, so maybe the, the measurement quality is worse. Right? But it's actually as, uh, as good as the data from other locations. So it turns out that the demographic relations, uh, demographic profile in Nottingham for the people that develop lung cancer is actually quite different from other parts of the UK. Is it pollution? 
Uh, so we don't really know the causal mechanisms, right? But all that we observe is that the demographic profiles is actually quite different. But it certainly invites hypothesis about the, the, the mechanism. Right, so that, what that means is that it's actually not data from Nottingham. It is good quality data, but it's actually uh, essentially shifting the distribution in a way that hurts the performance. So that's why it has the negative value. James, how do you, how do you evaluate quality of data? Right, so the quality here, uh, so to compute the Shapley value, uh, or, or, or the quality of data, so we basically, uh, so there are, for example, if you're collecting genomics data, right, so there are particular metrics to see how good is your sequencing machines, right, are there particular batch effects in those data, so we don't think there's issues there with that. But uh, the metric has to choose what the test data is going to be in some sense, so if you've chosen the test data, it'd be all from Nottingham as well, you might have gotten better. But, Good question. Yeah. So, so here we're using the standard test metric, which is, which usually is designed for the whole country, right? So it's here. It's, you have you have one lung cancer prediction algorithm that's applied to the whole country, and we're saying, okay, so if you include Nottingham's data in the training set, there, that's actually hurting that national predictor. Um, and we did it for other diseases to uh, colon cancer as well. Okay. So let's actually dive a little bit deeper into what are these negative values and what do they what do they actually mean? Right, so the first thing you want, want to care about is, that, okay, so if you take individuals, so remember we have the Shapley value for the center that I showed you before, but we also have the Shapley value for the individual participants. Right, so if you take individuals that have negative Shapley value and just simply remove them from your training data, right, what is that actually, how, what is that, how does that actually change the performance of the algorithm? Um, so just as a baseline comparison, let's say if you just randomly select individuals, right, remove them from your training data, Right, your training data is getting smaller and the algorithm's performance is, you know, it's getting worse, right? And here it's basically you take the negative leave one out individuals, right? So you remove those from your data sets, right? So the, uh, so the algorithm's performance is also getting worse, All right? But if you actually remove individuals with negative Shapley value, you actually see something that's very different, which is that the performance of the algorithm improves, right? Uh, as you're removing these individuals. So, just, so are the evaluations of the Shapley value on like a validation set that's separate from the test set? That's that right. Yeah, so we have two test sets. One's for computing Shapley value and one's for evaluating performance of the algorithm. Yeah, just leave one out also in the same, yes. doing the same thing. Yeah. And, yes. And is the test set evenly distributed across these locations or proportional to the? Uh... That's right. So it's a, it's a representative national sample test data set. And the test set's not changed? when you take out the data points? Yes, the test doesn't change, right? Here, we're just taking out data points from the training sets. Uh, James, this one is also on the biobank, or? This yes, this is for the same, uh, I believe, for the same cancer prediction task. Okay, so the flip side of this is that, okay, so instead of removing negative value in the individuals, let's add individuals that have high Shapley value. How does that change the performance of the algorithm? Right, again, for comparison, we just add random individuals, the red line here, where add individuals with high leave one out score. Right, so they actually basically do the same thing. But adding individuals with high Shapley value actually really improves the positive Shapley value and really improves the performance. Sorry, quick question on the previous slide. So why is leave one out worse than random on the previous slide? Um, so we find that actually for many settings, leave one out is doing essentially the same as random, right? Um, it's because these data sets are so large, they're quite noisy. So here, I don't know why, you know, why it's actually doing worse than random if you're removing more individuals. Um, but we certainly don't find it to do you know, any significantly better than random. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Back to the removing low value data. You know, this is like an overall accuracy measure, right? Is it possible that when you're removing low quality data, low value data, that you're actually maybe improving things in one part of your space, but actually reducing accuracy in another? They're, they're creating bias. Right, right. So that's, goes, I think, going just related to the previous question about what is, so you know, remember one of our, the ingredients for computing Shapley value is the perfor performance metric. Right. right. So here the performance metric is the standard one, which is the national performance on the, over the entire UK. Right, so certainly, I think if we design more fine-grained performance metrics, then we'll see different phenomena. Right, so here we're just saying, okay, so let's take the standard ones that people use. Right, how does actually removing, if that's the metric that you care about, which is what people do, right, how does actually removing the negative 
individuals affect that metric? I think certainly, it certainly raises the question of maybe that national metrics are not the best ones to use, especially with not related to fairness questions. So let me actually go a little bit more. So uh, maybe we can take some more questions in the next steps. OK. So this is also a more uh, closer investigation into the negative Shapley values. So it turns out that in some data sets, right, so the negative values actually come from data points that are just mislabeled. Right, so we had a particular sort of noisy label data set. And uh, we'll just look at the individual's data points that have negative Shapley value and just double check them to see are those actually correctly labeled or not. Right? We'll just manually check them again. Uh, and again, for comparison, we just take random data points or data points that have the smallest leave one out scores. So the y-axis here corresponds to how many mislabeled data points do I discover by checking these points that have the smallest, uh, you know, smallest values. If I do the value based on randomly or leave one out, uh, you know, there's very little difference in terms of how, how much they're discovering, how often they discover the, the bad data points. But if we actually check the data points that have negative Shafley values, you see very uh, clearly that you know, it's really detect detecting data points that are mislabeled. Right? Um, so, so that's sort of a, um, also a case where you can have negative Shapley values. Okay, so I think so. The first part is to show that um, you know, empirically. Oh, yes. Uh, so, this, these graphs you've been showing us, you've fixed the data set and you've fixed the performance metric. But I imagine you could get different graphs if you use different yes. learning algorithms. Yes. So how robust is this to changing the? Yeah, so, so, we, we, so we try a variety of learning algorithms, um, ranging from convolutional neural networks to logistic regression, so both small and large. Uh, so the results are, they do depend on the learning algorithm, but the overall trend is very robust. Right? So the leave, the leave one out always performs similar to random, um, and then Shapley tends to do substantially better than both. So in the in the appendix of the paper, we show the results for a lot of different learning algorithms. Can, can you get a theoretical result about this? Like uh, prove some theorem like that Shapley, for learning algorithms in this class, Shapley will guarantee yeah. better Yeah, so, uh, so that's a great open question where we have some ideas how to do that, but not, nothing concrete yet. But yeah, happy to chat more about that later. Okay, so the first part is just to show you that, okay, so both theoretically and empirically, right, so the commonly used leave one out scores actually really does not capture information, value of data, as well as the Shapley scores. Um, the second part I want to show you is actually how do we use the Shapley scores to really solve some of the fairness questions that arise from transferring machine learning models across different populations. So here's a standard kind of a, a, a setting, right, so you have uh, you know, image recognition, uh, and this is, I think, sort of a, a problem that many of you have, have worked on or have thought about. Right? So you have your training data, which would take sort of a standard benchmark training data sets. The data sets for training is actually quite imbalanced. Right? So you have a lot more, let's say, white males. So here I'm just showing you random samples from the training data. So if you actually deploy the algorithm in application, right, you see a lot more diverse individuals that's different from your training data sets, and that's why the performance drops, especially for minority applications. Um, but what we can do now is that we actually have a Shapley value right, for each of my training data points. So let's say if I have a small you know, curated test data set that come from uh, more diverse individuals, I actually have a, a value, right, positive or negative, for each of my training data points. So the simplest idea is what if I just simply reweight my training data point by its Shapley value? Right? The intuition being that data points that actually are more useful right, for the diverse populations would have higher Shapley value, and giving it higher values would improve the algorithm. Right. So here's basically we just you know, a random sample of um, the highly valued images right, from my training set. And you can see that they actually capture a lot more diverse individuals and also a lot more women. And it's just doing this simple idea of simply reweighting each of my training points by the Shapley value. I just retrain the same convolutional network right, on this data set actually immediately leads to quite substantial improvements in performance on, the t on, on deployment. So one of the goals of any machine learning algorithm is generalizability, right? And here you're fixing your test data set and asking when, by reweighting, are you improving the classification of that particular test data set? What guarantee is that it ah. generalizes to other tests? Okay, 
Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I think this is a bit related to Rich's question. So here we're actually quite careful, right? So we split the test data sets into two, right? So you have a small test data set that's just used to compute the Shapley value. And to do that, we actually just only need a few hundred examples. Right. And then to actually evaluate the performance, we do it on this held out test data set, which is much larger and it's independent from what's used for compute the Shapley value. So that's supposed to actually simulate the realistic settings where maybe I have a small curated data set, small but you know, well labeled, that I can use to compute the Shapley values. But then when I actually do a deployment, I have a lot more unlabeled data points. So another application of this, um, I think quite interesting, is uh, in, in medical settings. Right, so many of the algorithms that you, know, you see in the news about achieving sort of doctor or dermatologist level performance, they're actually trained by um, quite heterogeneous data sets scraped from the you know, Google image and so on. Right. So if you take one of these algorithms, or the training data sets, the random samples you can have, you know, if you just go, go on Google image and search for you know, different dermatology uh, conditions, you get all sorts of um, very heterogeneous lots of junk in the training data set. The clinical examples that you actually care about in application are, will, will look quite different. Right, and we typically have a small number of clinically labeled uh, test examples. So again, we can do the same idea, right? Just simply reweight each of our training points by the Shapley value, right? So the highly valued ones tends to pick out uh, images from our training set that are more, uh, you know, more informative, so less noisy. And simply doing this weighted training actually immediately improves the performance quite a bit, so by double digits on my clinical settings. So we tried this idea on, uh, these are two examples on a variety of other examples from images to natural language processing. So in NLP, you can also have these similar settings where it seems to be quite consistent that reweighting by Shapley value leads to substantial performance on my deploy examples, uh, on my deploy, deployment settings. Uh, there are certainly, I think there are limitations to how, how much you can push this approach, but I think this is sort of a general approach to potentially make some of the machine learning models more transferable and improve the fairness and equity. Okay, so in the remaining few minutes, I want to quickly go over some of the other um, questions that we had discussed, right, and leave some more room for, for discussion. So the first point is that, okay, so how do we actually compute Shapley value, especially when you have a large neural network and large model? Right. So, so there's a lot of things on here, but let me just explain the intuition. So the intuition is that, remember, to compute the Shapley value, you're essentially looking at how much does adding this data point contribute to different subsets of other data points in my training set. So that's actually in some way not so different from how what you're already doing when you're computing gradient descent over your entire training set, right? If you do SGD, you're just taking, let's say, a one pass over your, your training data set. So what we're doing here is basically to compute, to estimate Shapley value, intuitively we just look at multiple epochs. Each epoch I have a random permutation of all of my training points. And I keep track of at every gradient step how much did each batch or each individual training point, the gradient for that point, how much did that actually improve the algorithm? Right. So that's actually my estimate for the marginal contribution of adding a data point to my previous set. Right. So the time for computing this is essentially the same time as it takes me to train the original convolent, to train the original deep learning model. So this does not give you a sort of exact Shapley value. Um, but if you actually imagine doing this uh, sort of in parallel over several different multi color iterations of the permutations of your training points, then you can actually get better um, multi color estimates for the Shapley value of your data points. So that's actually how we um, estimate Shapley value uh, on these large, large ML models. So a couple of other questions that people, I think related to questions that people brought up here, right? So first is that, so you know, in the game theory context, everything is given, right? So the players are given, but in context of data science, in machine learning, right, data is actually sampled from distributions. Right. So then it's natural to ask about, okay, so what are the statistical properties of this Shapley value, which itself is now a random variable, right? That depends on the underlying data distribution. So I think that's actually a very wide open area. There's very little, known about the statistical properties, and that's something that, uh, that we've uh, been working on, or we're starting to work on. Um, so the second point uh, is that so typically, uh, so right now to compute the Shapley value, we actually require that we have access to the whole data set, right, to the entire training data set. 
So typically, um, let's say if you're, you know, uh, if you're a company looking at data sets from different potential different vendors, you don't actually have access to the entire data set from the, each of the vendors. Maybe you only have access to a small subset of the data sets. So there's an interesting question about how do you actually efficiently extrapolate Shapley values from small subsets of data. And then this point, I think, is also uh, brought up in one of the earlier questions. Um, so there's these three properties that I listed for the Shapley value. But I think they're not always appropriate in certain data science uh, context. All right, so for example, the Shapley value, as we've seen, can be negative. But in many contexts, uh, you know, we can't really charge people money for the data that they generate, right? even if it ends up being in terms of noisy or negative data. Right? So often, you, the best you can do is say, OK, so you know, if your data ends up having negative Shapley value, we'll just assign it zero value or some baseline value. Right? So that turns out that actually already breaks the formulations of Shapley value. Right? So you, can actually, you cannot, you know, not as, so if you basically threshold the negative values to be zero, right? so that actually breaks a lot of the other axioms and properties of Shapley value. So how do you actually? You know, how, do, how can you design valuation schemes that are robust to that? And the current scheme of the Shapley value is also vulnerable to certain manipulations and attacks. Right? So for example, you have individuals, you know, let's say if they, mani they can manipulate their data in a way to ex extract higher values uh, from, the, from the algorithm. So I think these are all um, sort of open areas that requires more investigation. So, so we think of the Shapley value as sort of a, you know, a first step towards really thinking about more systematic ways to quantify the value of data in the context of machine learning. Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be an extremely fundamental, important question given all the regulations about data valuation and how to, you know, how to charge companies for the value of these data. Uh, in addition to sort of these regulatory questions, I, mean that this, I think the data Shapley value it's actually quite useful for some core ML tasks, such as like domain adaptation and so on. Um, and here, uh, as we said, so the value depends on the task. Right? So you have to be very careful in choosing what task you're evaluating towards. So this is not really getting at the point of what is the intrinsic value of data. Right? So we're not trying to say this data has some intrinsic value. Here, the value only makes sense with respect to a specific task. And that may be uh, a limitation to the approach as well. So we have the, all the software and the paper available for computing estimating Shapley values. So I'm happy to, to take some more questions. Questions, comments, data? Any more questions? Yes. Um, yeah, just what sort of uh, caveats should be attached to this as well, like fairness caveats? Um, I guess uh, we can, there's the places we can say this improves an algorithm, but um, I guess my fear is that uh, if we have some notion of fairness or equitability uh, in how we define something, then a startup or a big company can just say, okay, if I attach this to it, then I can call my thing fair. But um, like if we're predicting recidivism rates or something, can improving an algorithm just say it, uh, if the algorithm is predi predicting how racist our society is, would improving an algorithm just say it predicts the racist society better, but people that use recidivism algorithms would say uh, this is just reflecting how society is, and we need to be just as racist as it's telling us to be. Um, so, like, is there a good way to formulate uh, caveats where I guess if we're talking where it works, where, how can we talk about where it wouldn't work as well? Is the question. Yeah, so I think those are certainly important questions to consider. So the the current setting of the data Shapley value is really developed around um, the idea of how do we value data that's already in place, right? And algorithms that are already being trained on those data, how do we actually assign values there? And that's, as we said, it's motivated by the current policy and regulatory questions where we actually need to value, come up with values for those kinds of data for the existing algorithms. So I think going forward, maybe one interesting application of Shapley values, think about what are ways to collect better data Right, because uh, if you really want to maybe fundamentally improve the performance of your models, you certainly, need, especially across more diverse populations, you actually need to collect better data sets. Right. And, uh, and we've seen that one application of the Shapley value that I mentioned briefly is when you actually, you know, if you just take individuals with high Shapley value, right, and add them to your data set, that actually helps the model a lot more than adding other settings. Right, so it's now becoming closer to like an active learning kinds of setting. 
And I think that's one interesting places where you can think about, you know, if we know which kinds of data is more valuable, can we actually put more resources allocations to collect more data from those populations? I guess my question is not that the data is bad or it's incorrect, that the data is good, but it's reflecting bad biases we already have. Um, so that a Shapley value would actually do well in saying that actually, yeah, uh, the prediction thing would be predict actually it's even more racist than we previously thought. But um, right. So in that case, I would say it still might be useful to use Shapley value as a diagnostic tool, right? Now you see, okay, so what are the training data points that are leading to potentially damaging predictions? Yes. So, I mean, so many of these questions that have been asked could be addressed if there could be a Shapley value definition for a metric that's not a scalar but a vector. So, for example, if you have a, I mean, a metric that takes into account fairness to, I mean, or accuracy on different populations or something like that, rather than just one value, it's a vector of values. Is there, is there any hope of defining a Shapley value for vector output metrics? Is it? I think that's a great idea. Um, I mean, so the current approach is. Usually people, if you have multiple objectives, those are added together with you know, some hyperparameter into one sort of Lagrangian term. If, once you have that, then you, you can compute Shapley <laughs> values for it. But if you actually really have sort of, you know, honest uh, vector of objectives, then uh, we don't know how to extend this right now. Uh, two questions. Well, one's a question, one's a comment. Uh, questions. Um, when you mentioned the manipulability of Shapley values, um, what were you assuming you can validate? Like, what, what parts of a, a data point that I have of someone's can I verify that they have manipulated or not manipulated? Uh, because that presumably matters a lot. Uh, and then the other comment I would make is, while computer scientists do a lot of work and generally call everything like worst case, Economists do do things in a distributional sense, so you should probably, if you're talking to economists, like things like Shapley values are only defined in terms of, anyway, that's more of a comment than a, than a question. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the manipulation, I think that's a wide open area, right? Um, so currently, to, in order to compute the Shapley value, we're essentially working in a somewhat constraint setting where I imagine I have the algorithm and I already have all of the training data set together. I collect it, now I'm just computing these values. So, so what can people do to manipulate, I guess, is my question. Are they like adding hues of purple to the image? Like that, you know, this is the... Yeah, so potentially people could, for example, uh, you know, add additional, or modify the features in the data set. They could even do things like um, maybe create multiple fake accounts, right? Just duplicate the data k times and create those fake accounts to, to extract some more, 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 more revenue. Um, so, so those are all possible manipulations. Yeah, okay, one quick question. Yeah, this is just for your UK lung cancer example. Did your classifier take in uh, the location the data point came from as a covariate? Yes, so, so I remember the, so the classifier would have various demographics, uh, the, the location as well as some various file markers and lifestyle information. So even if it knows that the, that the data point came from not account, the non points are still doing worse. Like it's, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I mean, so, that's, so there could be quite complicated interactions that's between these features. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you.